take a closer look at those sunspots we saw developing in the opening sequence. But first, let's go back to yesterday's goodbye blast from the northern sunspot group and the wide angle of effect through the corona. We set it with the red C2 coronagraph yesterday, and I think it holds here on Soho C3. Ejecta can be seen out both sides of the central blocking disk and to the south. Both NASA and NOAA's Enlil spiral have the CME missing by a hair, but truthfully, the edge of that impact isn't something we need to fear anyway. The best bet is that Monday night we'll begin to see some of the minor signatures. No geomagnetic storm is forecast. We saw this in the opening, the development of another sunspot group. Our few days of space weather quiet forecasted yesterday may have to wait as this one wasn't there at all yesterday morning. Today it's already developed beta class magnetism, but is doing so well split front to back. We'll be monitoring the development and x-ray signatures of this one today. Now folks, just three days ago in the May 27th show, we suggested you watch our 90-minute presentation on how to predict earthquakes. This was because of the top story on how water was the key to deep earthquakes, where the rock is basically liquid and the pressure is magnanimous. How do you actually get a slip of the rocks? Water. It was our answer years ago when the model started. But veteran observers know, it's not just water, but the number one constituent of the relevant portion of Earth's interior. Olivine. Billy's experiments with self-translocating crystals based on capacitance and discharge was something even those in the field had never seen before. And combined with the water aspect, we felt pretty much we had the full story, especially when we had them working in the same environment. Three days ago, it was the water. Today, it's the olivine. In just three short days, we've seen both critical aspects of blood echoes, the deep foreboding quakes tied to the exact things we use in the model for how to predict them. Moving on to the eye candy, colliding wind binaries. We've seen a number of amazing animations and visualizations of the models of their interaction. And today, they are going a step beyond the observations and model the particles at the key point of energetic collision. Through this model run, they were able to see how some of the material feeds back into the magnetic cusps of the stars and the rest is evacuated, often quite violently. The model produced a number of key stills with velocity, magnetism, and overall plasma pressure, but it also told them that these stellar throwdowns are the producers of some of the highest energy cosmic rays we see. Excellent paper on this out of Frontiers, linked below. Coming back at the climate fight, since none of those professors took up my offer to chat, I'll share the identification of what they call egregious failures of the CMIP models, ones that still exist today in the sixth edition of that climate dance. One of the key aspects of our argument against those climate folks was the effect of urbanization, the urban heat island effect. And here we learn that it results in now about half the warming seen in China, a false signal. That's much more than even I realized when I made the argument. How about that? Last in the climate realm is a recognition that the way they are looking at solar input is in need of a major rethink. The one they have in mind likely won't capture particle forcing and field coupling, but it's a start. Interesting one up here on glacial catchments studied in the Greenland area, revealing the largest concentration of mercury in the entire region, dwarfing the Arctic River content and being so high that the only explanation the scientists could give is that a mysterious geological source of mercury is hiding beneath the Greenland ice sheet. What it is and how it got there, they're not touching that one. Now last but not least folks, the critical frequency of the F2 layer of the ionosphere has been dropping for a few decades. This is confusing because the sun has been dropping its activity for the last few decades as well. And as you can read in this seminal paper, the dropping solar activity should be boosting the critical frequency of the ionosphere. Yes, it does go up a bit with higher irradiance, but it gets whacked down with CME, so in theory, it should be going up with the dropping sun. And they can only guess at climate change being the cause for it actually going the other way. But above the stratosphere, D region, E region, and up to F2, I don't think so. Then again, these scientists actually knew that, said it to get the paper past carbon-fearing peer reviewers, and still managed to slip in the real causes of the ionospheric shift in there for those of us who understand how the upper parts of the planet actually work. Folks, with this here on Earth and yesterday's shift on Mars, we're going to need to update the list.